investing your time in studying the Word of God is one of the best investments you can make, right? Because it's limitless. Really, like, I remember giving a, my Bible to my aunt when I first got saved because she was, like, a strong Catholic and didn't really believe in reading her Bible. And I gave it to her, and she said, well, what do you want me to do with it after I read it? <laughs> I said, well, you're going to read it again. And she said, why? I said, because you're going to get something new out of it the second time when you read it. And then read it again and read it again after that, right? Am I telling you the truth here? Isn't it so rich that no matter how long you've been a Christian and how many times you read it, and there's so many new versions of the Bible out now that help you understand it in a different light. And that's what happened to me this week. I was studying for the Tuesday night class that I teach, and uh, it's, you know, about the anointing with David. He had three different anointings, if you uh, remember his life. Samuel, the first time when Saul was rejected, God sent Samuel and, and anointed him with oil. And then David became the king of half the nation many years later. So that was the second anointing. And then the third time uh, when he was 37 years old, so probably about 20 years after that original anointing, he became king over the whole nation. And as I was studying that anointing, this verse was brought to my attention. And uh, we read it. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck. So what's a yoke? You remember when Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? What, what is that? Like not everybody even fully remembers what that's about. It's a farming term, right? And it was two cattle. When they put the ox or the cattle next to each other, they would yoke them together with a clamp around their neck. It was like being a prisoner. And they would put a younger one with an older one because they wanted the older one to train the younger one how it would work, right? And look, you know, like we're heavy laden and we're burdened. We have this heavy yoke. And Jesus said, no, yoke yourself up to me because my burden is what? Light. And that's great, isn't it? So that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to get that old thing broken off us and come in under his yoke. And when we're with him, things go easy. But this is talking about the enemy's yoke. And it says that the yoke of oppression of the enemy will be destroyed because of the anointing. So God's power comes inside of us. And, and what I like about this other version of the Bible that I had never seen before, it says the yoke will be taken off because your neck will be too large. <laughs> so that's a very different picture than just God coming in and breaking it off for you. He just strengthens you so much that your muscles grow so big that the yoke just breaks off because you're too big underneath it. That's a better picture, isn't it? And that's what I want. And that's, that's what I believe happens to us as Christians. The anointing comes on us. It says that actually about Samson in the Bible, that when the anointing came on him, he killed 30 men, right? It, it would just come on people in births in the Old Testament. Happened to David too. When he got anointed, it says the Spirit of God filled him from that day forward. And just that was in 1 Samuel 16. In the next chapter, he killed Goliath, right? So, boy, there's something about the anointing of God. How many want more of that? Every hand should be going up. We all need more power, right? But I just haven't gotten that word picture out of my mind that it's not just God coming in and doing it for me. He strengthens me, and I become like the Incredible Hulk in a Holy Ghost way. And those old yokes, those old bondages, those shackles that were on me just have to break off because I got too big. <laughs> I think you should flex your muscles a little. You'll feel better. All right, so let's just look at a couple of examples of that. And, and this is my, um, my way of doing what Tricia said. She said to rewrite your declarations. That was so powerful. And you'd think that we would know what each other is preaching. <laughs> We've been together 33, 34, is it? Going to be 34. I know you're clapping for me <laughs> because I survived. I'm really fast. That's why. <laughs> so rewriting your decree is so powerful. There's something about writing it down and, and just speaking it out loud. And that's what happened to me again this week was like the Lord said, you need to write it down, and, and we're going to focus on that part of the formula. Somebody used that word this morning, that part of the process when God comes in and strengthens us and gives us the ability for that old yoke to break off. But we're not supposed to just stay out on our own after the old yoke breaks off. We then have to yoke ourselves in with Jesus, right? And that old yoke just could be habits in our lives. 
It could be really destructive behavior that we're involved in that every other area of our life could be going well, but this one thing could be hurting us really badly. And it's hard to talk about because, you know, as a Christian, we're supposed to be everything always going so good all the time. But part of deliverance is for Christians too. Did you know that? You know deliverance happens for Christians as well? A few people laughing here. Yeah, right. I mean, because some people walk in a little naively thinking, oh, no, once I become a Christian, all that stuff gets cleaned up. Well, a lot of stuff gets cleaned up, so that's good. But then there's those little foxes that try to hang in there and spoil the vine. And the Lord's saying, no, you know what? I'm going to anoint your life, and you're going to grow so strong, that thing's not going to be able to hold on to you anymore. You're going to be like a grease pig at the county fair. <laughs> the devil's going to try to grab you, and you're going to be so slippery, he ain't going to be able to catch you. <laughs> so I think, you know, again, I know this could get a little tedious, but I gave it in your handout, so you don't have to try to read it off the screen. But just pull the handout out of your bulletin that you were given on the way in. And I, and I just think there's something good about releasing it out into the atmosphere. So we're going to say it out loud together, okay? This is falling under that same topic of what Tricia said, that we're kind of rewriting our declarations and rewriting our decrees, because what we were is not what we are. Believe that? I am going someplace. I am on my way to a better destination. So let's read it. It says, the victorious journey of the believer. Ready? Number one. I was under the death sentence yoke of sin's bondage. So a yoke is something that clamps you down when you're attached to an evil source that's next to you. It's something that empowers you when you're yoked up to Jesus. But before I knew Jesus, I had a death sentence yoke on my life. How about you? It was really obvious in my life. Some people, it's not so obvious. But for me, it was. I was under the death sentence yoke of sin's bondage before I knew Jesus. I'll, let's read two. I recognized I was doomed to eternal damnation and repented of my sin. How about you? You really have a hard time repenting if you don't recognize the problem that you're in. And you have to recognize that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And how many of you, before you became a Christian, you said, yeah, but I'm a good person? <laughs> that wasn't good enough, was it? Because we still had original sin in our lives, and, and us on our own without the Lord isn't getting us in. We can't find favor with God. You can only find favor with God coming in behind the cross coming in behind the substitutionary work of Jesus. And that's number three. Let's read it. I accepted Christ as Lord and was delivered from my sin nature. You agree? Now, that doesn't mean you never sin anymore, but you were delivered from the nature of sin. That's a big difference, isn't it? And, and don't get confused about this. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you never sin you, you do still make mistakes, but now you're aware of that sin, and you can repent of it quickly, can't you? You can be pliable. I remember as a Catholic growing up, they said that we needed to say the act of contrition. Anybody else remember that? I never knew it, really what that word contrition meant, but then you study it out and you see it means to be contrite. It, it means to feel sorry about something to the point where you say, boy, if I could do that over again, I would not do it the same way as opposed to just feeling like, oh, man, I got caught, but I really didn't do anything wrong. No, contrition is what the Lord says in Psalms. It says he's close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Not the broken spirit part, like because you're grieving about something, but because you're, you're like, oh, I wounded the heart of God with my, my actions. And sin as a way of causing us to wound the heart of God. And then we come in and we say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I love you too much. I don't want to behave that way anymore. But I need you to get down into my engine and clean the fuel that's running my engine so I don't keep whatever, cursing or gambling or drinking alcohol or spending the money, uh, the mortgage money on something, you know, some bad habit that I have. Because I know it's wrong, but in my own strength, I, I haven't been able to conquer this thing. Well, that's why the anointing comes in and breaks the yoke. <laughs> But it can't happen until he's Lord of your life, right? So I was under a death sentence of sin. I recognized it and repented. And then Jesus came in as Lord and delivered me from the nature to sin. Not the act of still sinning. I still do that, not intentionally. But my nature is no longer number one about me. Before you knew the Lord, you woke up every morning and number one, two, and three on the top ten was you. <laughs> That was the most important three things. Location, location, location. Me, me, me. Not as a Christian. 
Now Jesus is sitting on the throne. Now it's, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Number four is good, right? Let's say it. God anointed me with his Holy Spirit's power and his divine nature. Ooh, that's the new dispensation that we're in. You become a Christian, you get the Holy Spirit's presence in you. has to be there, the Bible says, because you can't say Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit is the one to direct you to do it. Now, he shows himself in different ways, but we can always ask for more. That's okay. You're allowed. You can keep going up for seconds and thirds and fourths. Say, Lord, I want more of your power, more of your presence. You can say like John the Baptist, less of me and more of you, Lord. That includes more of your Holy Spirit. If there's things in my life that are stopping me from serving you at a greater level, show them to me because you said if it offends, cut it off. If there's a habit that I'm doing, like watching too much television or playing too many video games, or there could be all kinds of things we could talk about, right? We know what those things are. But I haven't had the power. I haven't been able to control my appetite in that area. Lord, I'm asking you to help me. Come in and break this yoke off that I have to eat too much sugar, too many carbs, whatever that thing is, whatever that comfort food is that you know is not just for nutrition. It's because I'm stressed out about something, and instead of going to the Lord, I've been going to the refrigerator. Break that thing, right? We can't we can't allow our appetites to control us. We got to allow the Lord to say, no, uh, it's it's not by your might and not by your power. It's not your willpower. It's my power in you, and I've given my power to you through my Holy Spirit. That's so cool. But he didn't just give me His Spirit. He gave me His divine nature because He said He's allowed me to be a partaker of His divine nature. You should look at somebody and say, that's amazing. <laughs> that I get, going from that old corrupt person that couldn't put two and two good things together to now being a partaker of the divine nature. Well, I want more of his divine nature and less of my corrupt nature. That will try, you know, still on occasion that old corrupt nature tries to resurrect itself. But no, the Bible says I, I have been made a partaker of the divine nature. Next time you're having an argument with somebody you love, say, you know, I'm just going to pray that divine nature will take over because it's not in charge right now. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's right. You need to get more divine nature in your life. <laughs> not that me and Trish have ever argued, but I've heard about other people <laughs> that that happens on occasion. <laughs> And then what happens? I love number five. Come on, let's read five. God's anointing increases my strength, causing new spirit muscles to grow. <laughs> I just love that picture, right? It's like the anointing breaks the yoke because I got new muscles now. And that old skinny little jacket that used to fit doesn't fit on me anymore because I've been made stronger by the Lord. And it's like going to the gym for free. And you get buffed up with Jesus just by his presence in you, just by flushing out all that old junk. And now I got new muscles. So five to six is really key because six says my new spirit muscles shatter yokes of bondage that constrain me. I don't have to be held back by those things any longer. I hope it's working for you because this picture really helped me all week long as I was thinking about the different things that we try to help people with, that I try to help myself with, that we try to say, what is it about the enemy's plans that seem to get in and stick when as Christians we should know better and we do know better, it just hasn't gone from our head down into our actions yet. It's a lot of things, we'll talk about some of them today, it's not you know, exhaustive, but there's certain things you know are true, right? One of them is right here, is that you have to immerse yourself in the word of God. You can't know God's will if you don't spend any time learning what God's will is, right? So we get in really big trouble when we don't know the word because then we don't have anything to withdraw from our account because we didn't make the deposit. But then we can't ignore the spirit piece either because too much word without enough spirit, and then we become legalistic, and that becomes a whole bondage in itself, doesn't it? So there's some balance that we know we talk a lot about that it's got to be the Lord is seeking those who will worship him in both spirit and and in truth, and, and that Holy Spirit part is what we're talking about today. That's what fills us. That anointing is what breaks the yoke, but he needs raw material to work with, doesn't he? Because you can't confess the word if you don't know the word. 
And boy, the devil's really good at tricking people about what, what the word's about and what it's not. And did God really say? That's how we started in, in, in Genesis, right? All right, go to number seven. I daily yield my will to the Father and pray for... I think we should say that again. I daily yield my will to the Father and pray for Holy Spirit guidance. I didn't say the Holy Spirit's guidance. I said Holy Spirit's guidance because I don't say the Trisha. I say Trisha. <laughs> so Holy Spirit is a name. And we pray for Holy Spirit guidance. Amen? It's okay to say the Holy Spirit too. I get that. That's in the Bible. But think of Holy Spirit as a person that you're talking to. And, you know, I was in a men's group yesterday morning, and men have a harder time asking for help than women. Let's just put that on the table. Anybody want to argue with that? I think that's a kind of a human universal that we all would understand. Not every single guy, but in general, as a breed, men just think, no, I should be able to do that myself. And that translates into us not praying enough. And it's like, why not? Because it's free. God says you could come any time you want. I'm a good dad. I want you to ask me. Ask me my opinion. And we were studying David's life, and that's Bible study as well. And it was so cool because David kept inquiring of the Lord over and over. It says, David inquired of the Lord. And there's a great lesson in that, and here it is right in 7. So if I want to avoid those ditches, I'm going down the road, but then all of a sudden I blow my cool, I lose my temper, I yell and scream at somebody, boom, I'm in a ditch. And that wasn't God's perfect plan for that situation, was it? Very, very rarely is you blowing your cool going to be God's answer. It might be. could be an occasion where, you know, there's a one-off where you have to. But most of the time, that's just your flesh getting in the way, isn't it? Wouldn't it have been great if there was a Holy Ghost circuit breaker on the inside that just as you were about to blow your cool, the Lord just got up in your grill and said, nope, don't do this. This is a big mistake. Don't accept this assignment. It's from hell. <laughs> and you're like, oh, God, thank you so much. Do you remember when Abigail met David on the road back in the Old Testament? She's such a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. David had been on the run because Nabal offended him, because Nabal wouldn't give them provisions after David and his men had been protecting uh, Nabal's men out in the field. And, you know, David was battle fatigued at this point. And it was like... He, he got the word back that Nabal said no, they weren't going to give any provisions, and, and David just said something that's very Italian. He said, strap on your swords. <laughs> like, we all know what that means. Strap on your swords. That's not a lot of words, but it carried a lot of weight. We're going to go and wipe out the house. He didn't want to give it to us. We're going to go take it. See, that is the flesh kicking in. And when that thing kicks in, it's really hard to reverse that curse except the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes. And on the way, God sends a messenger named Abigail, which was Nabal's wife, and said, you're about to make a big mistake. And David stopped and listened, and he said, bless the Lord for sending you to me today, because I realize now I was about to make a really big mistake. You look it up sometime. I didn't break it out today on the scriptures, but... She's a powerful woman, Abigail. That's a representation of Holy Spirit. And that could be your wife, man. Somebody say amen. amen. Not one man said amen. amen. Okay, thank you. Because, like, they're afraid I'm going to give the women license to now be in charge of everything. No. Trish is like, well, you know, if the shoe fits, no. No, but we're a partnership, right? And boy, nobody knows you better than your spouse. And ideally, and nobody's got better intentions for you than your spouse. So if they're warning you about something, there might be a really good reason for that. It works both ways. We all bring something to the table, and we, we complement each other's gifting. Me and Trish are so much alike, right? <laughs> we actually had a prophet come, Sharon Stone. She hasn't been here in a while, but she's awesome. And she said, you know, uh, the Lord prompted me to talk about you, a husband and wife, today. And she said, I had to stop and think. I said, she said, I don't think I've ever met two people more different than you and Tricia as a husband and wife who are still married. <laughs> so, so opposites attract. Not really, because we both love the Lord. Our temperaments are just different. And no, that's okay, because as long as you don't kill each other, it can be a great strength. We haven't killed each other. Yeah. Yeah. Almost. 
So that's why I daily yield my will to the Father. <laughs> but boy, I don't know of a better discipline than before you do anything else in the morning, you get on your knees, take communion, <laughs> take these little extra cups that we'll give you, buy them online, have that little communion cup, start your day on your knees and say, Lord, I submit, boom, break that little piece of bread. I submit my flesh to you. My flesh is not going to win. I submit my flesh to you. I take the blood of Jesus. I take the body. This is going to be my first meal. I yield myself, Lord, to your will over my life. I don't want to be running roughshod. I don't want my temper to get in control of things. I need to hear your voice clearly. And whatever those things that he shows you, you know, that you know are the little foxes that try to spoil your vine, we're going to get to that. That's going to be part two here. This is going to be a fun day. But I don't want to rush. Let's do eight. <laughs> Number eight says, as I submit to God, I'm increasingly transformed into the image of Christ. Woo! That's free. The Lord allows you to keep increasing. He transforms you with ever-increasing glory into his image. Wow. These are miraculous things that only he could do. It doesn't mean you start looking more like a Jewish carpenter. <laughs> you're not transformed into his physical image, but your character takes on his traits, right? And we have um, really found out over the years, uh, 20 years now since we started the church, we started by saying we are going to value character more than people's gifting. But you say amen. Amen. Except that when you start a church, you need a lot of help, right? You need volunteers everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> it's just funny, right? Because I was leading worship before I came out here in our prior church. So it's like, oh, yeah, I can lead worship. That's no problem. And I've got a laptop, so I can just set up the projector beforehand, and I can put the PowerPoint over there, and I'll just get a little foot pedal. <laughs> so I'll just lead worship, and I'll change the slides while I'm... While I'm leading worship, I'll just hit the foot pedal. I'll have the words right in front of me on the screen. And it's like, yeah, now all you need is one of those little cymbals on your butt. And you can play drums, too. And get a little monkey on your shoulder, and he can take the offering. It's just like, what do you have to do? Everything? Are you crazy? Right? But, you know, in the beginning, you do what you got to do. And somehow God still shows up anyway. But, like, no, it's like, I'll send you help. Look at all the help he sent. Isn't this awesome? So you guys are a beautiful family, and you're so generous, and you're so, like, well, I would say thank you again for Pastor Appreciation Day, the things you wrote, and just the gifts that you gave. It really meant a lot to us, and, and I want to say thank you to that. So I just, you know, as I think back over the 20 years, and I think about the transformation that I've seen happen in people's lives, it's mind-boggling. And it can only be attributed to God. And what Trisha quoted also, exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine. You're sitting there praying with somebody, and you know they're in a messy situation. And then years later, you're looking at their family like it doesn't even look like the same family because of God. Right? Like only he could do that. Doesn't happen for every single person. And I'm not going to say I have an easy answer for that. But part of it is here, number eight. We have to submit to God first, right? That's not easy to do, is it, church? Let's be really honest. Is it? Help me out. Submitting to God is not easy. Not my will, but your be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not so easy. But when that happens, he allows us to be transformed into his image. Let's read nine. I like this one, too. It's an action, an action number. <laughs> I fuel continued spiritual growth through immersion in the Word of God. All right? So there's just a pillar that you're going to need to know. You know, you can't just stick the Bible under your pillow at night and hope you wake up with 10 chapters memorized the next morning. Still not a bad idea to put the Bible under your pillow. <laughs> like, if you're counting on osmosis, <laughs> that might be a little lazy. <laughs> you got to crack it open and read it, and not just read it, but study it, right? And it's good to do that with other people. It's good to study the Bible in groups because other people see things about it that, that you won't see. So I've got to be immersed in the Word. I've got to be 
Now, obviously, I only gave you 10, so I can't give you every single possible thing. But this is the journey part, right? Recognizing I was under a death sentence. God gave me new muscles. The Holy Spirit comes. That anointing breaks the yoke. doesn't matter that 100 things in my life are going well. I'm going to start learning how to focus on those three or four things that are slowing me down because I want them out. I want to detox. If somebody spoke a curse over me, I want that curse broken, right? Because I don't want anything the enemy's doing to slow me down on the mission that God has me on. That's where we've been the last couple weeks on breaking curses, right? Last week, we talked about the, the whole country of Israel was under a curse. And David just inquired of the Lord and said, what's going on? Three years, we've had a famine. Anybody remember what happened? What was the cause of the curse? Saul. It was due to the prior king. But nobody was aware of what happened. Saul had broken a vow. And that vow, a breaking of that vow, caused the whole nation to be under a famine. So it took David to be discerning enough as a prophet and a king to say, no, we're not, we're not settling for this. Famine is not God's will. We're going to seek the Lord. If we have to fast, if we have to pray, if we have to call a holy meeting and, and grab the congregation and, and have a convocation together. And we're not moving until we hear from the Lord about what the problem is. And, and then the famine lifted once he realized what the cause was. And that's number 10. Boy, I love this one. Ready? Going to read it. As enemy strategies are revealed, counteroffensives are launched at him. <laughs> All right. Now, you're already flipping over. You're not allowed to flip over until I tell you. <laughs> But I don't blame you. You're anxious. You want to see what's on the other side. But let's not miss counteroffensives. See, because a lot of us were raised up uh, in, a, in a different, I don't know, what's the right word? Like not aware enough about warfare and, and not realizing there's so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about warfare and talk about battle and that there's evil in the world and, and the devil wants to destroy us and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy and we don't just sit by and watch as he does it. We fight back, amen? <laughs> Louder, please? Yes, we fight back. We're not, we're not people that are up in the stands. We're out on the field engaged in the battle and not just saying, oh, well, if God wants that to happen, it'll just happen. No, no, we have to take an active part in this thing. And if there's a strategy coming against us, we need a counteroffensive against the enemy. Okay? Now you can flip over. <laughs> and again, this is just from a, a couple of hours of study in my time yesterday. It's not a comprehensive list. But it's some of the ones that I struggle with, so it helps me to write them down. So it says, Christian counteroffensives. <laughs> against the enemy, and then it just says a small sample, right? Because I'm sure we could fill up multiple pages of these little tidbits. What's the first one? I deny myself, take up my cross daily, and follow Jesus. That's one arrow. <laughs> Not so easy to deny myself, take up my cross daily, and follow Jesus. But if I'm looking for strategy against the enemy's strategy against me, that's one of the best things I can do. Like I said, start my day on my knees. Take communion. Not my will, Lord, but yours, yours be done. I deny my flesh. I deny my game plan, and I want your game plan, and I submit to your will. Now, you don't have to read them all out loud, but just track with me. I love my enemies. How's that for a counteroffensive? How about ministering in the opposite spirit that's coming against you as a strategy? <laughs> We're in a a world that's just corrupted by sin. So when we come in and we minister in the opposite spirit, we pull the plug on the enemy's power against us. I love my enemies. Whoo, boy, that's a faith statement, isn't it? I, didn't, I don't find that easy. I refuse, should say, I refuse to be anxious about anything. How about you? That's Philippians 4, 6. I refuse to be anxious about anything. I am joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. How about you? Romans 12, 2. I give no place to the enemy. I count it all joy when I fall into various trials. I pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. I study to show myself approved. I refuse to sin in my anger. I hide the word in my heart so I will not sin. I flee from sexual immorality. I bless those who curse me. These are getting hard, man. 
I take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I refuse to let the sun go down on my anger. You'd have to check with Trisha on that one. I cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I pray for those that despitefully use me. I use the mighty weapons God gives me to demolish Satan's strongholds. I pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I'm not overcome by evil, but I overcome evil with good. If my enemy is hungry, ouch. If he is thirsty, I give him something to drink. And I like this one too. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, I present my request to God. Boy, that's a mouthful, right? right? But wouldn't it be nice to start your day this way? I'm making some positive declarations and some positive confessions. This doesn't come natural, but it comes in the supernatural. And if we position our earthly body underneath that anointing of the Lord, that's what breaks the yoke. You want stronger muscles? Practice some of these things instead of just reading them in our Bibles. He said, blessed are those who don't just hear what I say, but, but do what I say. Okay, how you all holding up? What time is it? 11.48. All right. I'm, uh, I'm rounding second and heading towards third. Let's look at some scriptures. Luke 11. It says, Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. Now, again, let's just stop there for a second. You know, if you saw somebody sick, how many of you would have known that that could be a spirit? I'm guessing most people here, right? But most of us don't always uh, directly connect that to a spirit. But clearly, she's got one. It's, she's infirm, and it's a spirit. How long has she had it? For 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Anybody ever see anybody like this? With a condition like this, it's really hard to watch, isn't it? And like I, I'm in New York a lot, and I see people walking around on the streets that I'm like, these people are heroic to have the physical condition they have and to be coming out of their houses and their apartments and and trying to still navigate through the system over there. And you just want to go over and lay hands on them and pray the Lord will heal them right on the spot, right? And, and this one is particularly hard to watch when somebody's bent over and can't be straightened up. But if you want to think of a yoke of the enemy, there's, there's very few things you could think of that would be more of a picture of a yoke than somebody being stuck in this position, like a straitjacket that causes them to be bent over. And Jesus looks at this woman and says in verse 12, he called her to him and said, woman, you are what? Loose from your infirmity. In other words, the anointing is about to break your yoke. That yoke for 18 years that's been holding you back, my power, Jesus could have said, is going to come in and give you Holy Ghost muscles. And your muscles are going to grow on the inside so big that that yoke that the enemy's had on you is just going to pop off. And you are going to just stand up straight when the power of God comes and that anointing of God through Jesus breaks that yoke off. And he laid his hands on her, and boom, the incredible Hulk took over in the spirit. And this woman was made straight and, of course, did what? She glorified God. And, and then, you know, they gave Jesus a problem about this. That's, that's another yoke. The religious yoke was in the room right there. And they said, oh, well, no, you can't do that. You're, you're in violation. You healed her on the Sabbath. I mean, it's just hard to skip over that, isn't it? That, that religion could be so blinding and a different yoke could be over people's eyes that for 18 years this woman was bound and instead of rejoicing over the miracle, they choose to go legal and say, nope, you have to come back tomorrow. Bend back over and come back tomorrow. That's what religion does. Break that yoke too, amen? So look, it's a, I love the language. It says, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? Now, you know the prior context was, do you water your oxen on the Sabbath? So if that's not work, then how come me healing this lady on the Sabbath if you're considering that work, right? Shouldn't this woman be in a daughter of Abraham who Satan has bound for 18 years have this yoke be broken off of her, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And what's the answer, church? Yes, she should be loosed. How about us? Should we be loosed? I want to be loosed. How about you? Let's just ask the Lord. Lord, what, what's the yoke that needs to break? What muscles in me need to grow 
so that that old strap that's been holding me back will just be snapped off of me, and I will move forward in you. I will move to another level of transformation into your image with ever-increasing glory. I don't want to hold on to those yokes. I want them broken off of my life. Whatever they are, Lord, I give you permission to reveal those things to me so that I can move forward in you, in your power. Just, you know, it's like a, a picture of this lady. In whatever way the enemy's trying to hold me back, it's just like I'm strapped down and bent over and I'm not able to fully operate the way he wants me to. So he doesn't want me to stay in that state. So let's move forward, amen? Let's go to Hebrews uh, 14, I'm sorry, chapter 12. Anybody who's been through our... Possessing your vessel classes or Elijah house will know where I'm going right now. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone, come on, fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, how many remember this from Possessing Your Vessel or Elijah House class? Okay, it's on the bitter root judgment teaching. And last week we talked about inner vows. So I'm just going to try to bring out some common language of our church, of some of the things that we've noticed, that people that are Christians, that have been saved a long time, that are walking with the Lord, and look, they're not like falling apart. Their lives are prospering in many areas. But then there's this little fox that's spoiling one of the vines. Might be a bigger one. And it could be this bitter root judgment that they're holding on to in their life. And they think it's not an issue, but there's fruit. And the fruit isn't good. You remember what Jesus said? A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce. So if there's bad fruit in our lives, there's probably a bad root. Because a good tree can't produce bad fruit. So that means, okay, I have to dig a little further. I've got to go down. I've got to find out where that yoke is that the Lord's anointing is going to break. And it's usually a sin. And the sin is judging somebody. So this is a very powerful verse. I mean, every verse in the Bible is powerful, but like the context here is really powerful. It says, lest any root of bitterness springing up in you cause trouble, and by this, how many? Many become defiled. So it's not just you that gets defiled when you're carrying a judgment against somebody. It's many people that get defiled. And any of you ever struggle with judging people? Come on, be honest. You all do. <laughs> Time to get straight here and be honest. We all do. It's a human nature thing. But the longer we serve the Lord and the, and the closer we get and the more we are transformed into his image, the less likely we'll be victim to do that. Not just do it, but then even hold on to it. Because we all do that initial, we judge the book by the cover, but then the Lord comes in and says, no, you better not do that. That's bad. I didn't do that to you. Don't you do that to them. So maybe you judge your mother. Maybe you judge your father. That would be the two most likely people that you could have judged. And, you know, look, big, deep topic. I can't go too far into it. But if you did, you could have sinned against them because the Bible tells us to honor our mother and father, right? That life may go well with us, right? It's the first commandment with a promise to honor your mother and father. So look, how, how hard is it going to be to say to the Lord, Lord, please show me if in any way I have defiled myself and my family by not honoring my mother and father. If I have a bitter root judgment against my mother or father, please reveal it to me so I can repent of it and I can remove this yoke off my life. Your anointing will come in and destroy it. How hard is that? Not hard. But it just stays in secret and people don't want to do it. And why they don't want to do it is a pretty deep topic here. So let's just look at a verse and see if we can... <laughs> Relate. In Genesis 27, 41, it says, Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. <laughs> right? So you think you might have a little bitter root judgment going on here. Yeah, that's a sign. If you want to murder somebody, that's a sign. You, you, you probably have a judgment against them. <laughs> yeah. Just a little subtle sign that, you know, as you... As you dream at night, you picture your hands going around their throat and their eyes bugging out. And before you totally choke them, you're going to let off a little bit to make them suffer a little bit longer. And then you're going to choke them a little bit more. See, like, this is not Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit. 
That's the devil. Now, did Esau have reason to be mad at his brother? I mean, you always have a reason to be mad at somebody. Your parents weren't perfect. No parents are. If your parents, you're not perfect. Fair enough, right? So, look, it's not like you didn't have a reason to be upset about something. But when you cross the line and you judge them, then you sinned. And that sin has to be repented of. Okay, and I'm really oversimplifying a much deeper subject here. And that's the danger of talking about this stuff on a Sunday morning. We've got to go deep on it. But just so you understand the concept, the yoke was sitting on the inside hidden. And it was showing itself in bad fruit. But you didn't make the connection that it's because I'm defiling my family by dishonoring my parents because I judge them. And there's a part of my heart that hates them over something. And look, it's not that what they did was right, but I'm going to release this sin. I'm going to repent, and I'm going to forgive them for what they did to me, and I'm going to pray that they'll have a revival in their life. Now, if they're dead, that's harder, isn't it? They ain't going to have a revival in their life, but you could still honor their memory and clean your heart out from that problem. All right. So that's just one example, but I love what his mother said to him. It says, uh, the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. That was Esau and Jacob's mother. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said, surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. <laughs> Can you imagine how corrupt your heart is? If the thing that you're happy about is, oh, my father's dead. I'm finally going to be able to kill my brother. <laughs> this is upside down. But we get upside down sometimes, don't we? So that's what we ask the Lord to do. Just reveal that upside down part of my heart. Reveal where things aren't in line with what you want because I want them properly aligned. I want all cylinders hitting so that there's nothing holding me back. There's no curse. We've been talking about that. There's nothing that's stopping me from moving forward. We can bring a curse on ourselves by cursing our parents. That's one. There's so many more. I'm not going to hit them all in detail, but I'm going to hit a few. Acts chapter 10. I would, I would highly recommend memorizing Acts 10, 38. It says, Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with what? The Holy Spirit and... They always go together, the Holy Spirit and with great power. There's the anointing, Holy Spirit, and great power. That's yoke-breaking. He did wonderful things for others and divinely healed all who were under the tyranny of the devil. The devil is a tyrant, and he keeps people under tyranny, and he keeps you yoked down. And if you want to ever study this, I'm really planning on doing a class on marketplace, marketplace ministry and looking at the spirit of mammon. Because you want to talk about a tyrant, man. The spirit of mammon is a tyrant like you can't believe. No matter how hard you're working, it tells you you got to work harder. No matter how good you're doing, you're never doing good enough. More bricks, no straw. That's mammon. That's the secular uh, attitude of the world. And why Jesus said you cannot love God and mammon. Mammon is another whole force, Okay. That's a teaser for the class that will run down the road. He's a tyrant. That's my point. The devil is a tyrant. You get under that yoke. You get somebody under the yoke of mammon, that thing has to be broken. And it can only be broken under the anointing of God. They've got to get enough muscle on the inside to speak to that thing and say, no, you're not in charge. I'm not working seven days a week, 18 hours a day, just to keep feeding your greedy machine. <laughs> no, I got a God who loves me. And he gives his beloved rest. And I get to rest, and I'll actually work better if I rest. That's another biblical principle, isn't it? All right. So then it says, this is Luke uh, 14, when, when Jesus stood up in the temple. Again, the language you know it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? He has anointed me. There it is. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to at liberty those who are oppressed, even Christians. <laughs> right? Even Christians could need to be set at liberty. Amen? Yes, you know that. And, and that's a good thing, that we're all in this together. And as the Lord reveals things to us, we can talk about them with each other and not feel shame. Do you, do you know that? That, that, you, that church should be a place where you can be honest about the stuff that you're going through and not feel like, yeah, but if I say that I'm dealing with this problem of watching pornography... They're going to think less of me. Is anybody here going to think less of somebody? 
You're going to think more of the person for being honest because how are you going to fix the problem on your own? It hadn't worked so good up till now. It's the only way you're going to get help is to talk to somebody about it. And look, you know, if you're involved in some ministry or something, you might need to step down for a while. Nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. That's how you grow is that you recognize where the, where the foxes are spoiling the vine. And you say, you know what, devil? No. You are not yoking me down. Because then you're dealing with this problem, and it's compounded by the fact that you don't think you can tell anybody. We can get by with less people in ministry if they're growing and getting healthy. Amen. <laughs> All right, got a whistle on that one. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, never mind, I won't, I won't go off on too much of a tangent. Here we go. I'm just going to run down a couple lists, like I said, about bitter root judgments. I, you know, by definition, I can't go into a lot of detail. But just go back to your 1 through 10 list, okay? And let's just look from 4 to 5 and 5 to 6. Because this is kind of the lens I want you to look at this stuff through. Because we're just, we can only look at samples. We can't look at the whole big picture. But four said, God anointed me with his spirit's power and his divine nature. Now, I know I'm not fully operating in all areas in spirit's power. But I am in some. And I'm not operating in his divine nature in every area. But I am in some. And he loves me. And he wants me more. He's trying to transform me. So four is like my hope. I have that power and his nature. Five is that he's increasing my strength. And as I get strength in a certain area, let's just say I believed a lie that I was never going to amount to anything. Could that have happened to somebody's life? Because an authority in your life might have spoken over you and said, you're never going to amount to anything. You're stupid. You're never going to amount to anything. When would God ever say that to you? Never. So now it's a it's a contest between the lie of the devil and the truth of the word. And, and your muscles got conditioned to thinking, I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm never going to amount to anything. But look what it says in 5. No, his anointing increases my strength and causes new spirit muscles to grow. And now I can look in the mirror and say, I am going to amount to something. And I can look at myself and say, you are going to amount to something. You are not a failure. You are who God says you are. And all of a sudden, boom. The muscles are growing, and those straps that are holding me down from that yoke, are, poof, they're starting to pop off. I'm not turning greed like the Hulk did. All right. This is the Holy Ghost version. And now all of a sudden, I don't even believe that lie anymore. And it's amazing how the truth will break the lie, isn't it? And now all of a sudden, I believe I am going to amount to something because God says I'm going to amount to something. And that lie doesn't have a hold on me. And that's six. My new spirit muscles shatter yokes of bondage that constrain me. There's the transition. And now daily I yield myself. And as I submit, I'm transformed. And then I fuel the continued growth by immersing myself in the word. And then as those enemy strategies are revealed, I come up with a counteroffensive. I don't just stand by and let him wail away. I mean, no, no, I get counteroffensives against the enemy. So these are just different things like bitter root judgment that I talked about, where there could be something hiding. And forgiveness, that's just another universal thing. I can almost guarantee you, every one of us in here has somebody we have to forgive. And it's not because we haven't already started the process of forgiveness, but we just haven't fully completed it. Take it by faith, okay? Ask the Lord, is that slowing me down? Am I holding unforgiveness in my heart towards somebody? Is that slowing me down? Because I don't want that yoke. I don't want to be strapped down and bent over. I can't fully operate when I'm bent over. And then cracked foundation, what could that be? Uh, if you remember from our class, I, I gave you a, a testimony by Danny Silk, and he talked about growing up in a home where there was nothing but violence and racism, and his mom divorced her first husband, Danny's father, and over the course, I think it was five years, there were 30 different men that lived in their house, and, and there was a gap. He said he, was, he had a toolbox deficiency of what it meant to be a real man, and, and he was imprinting himself onto the wrong people and he was taking on the wrong image of what it meant to be a man so he had a cracked foundation how many kids are growing up today with no dad in the home right so it's not just that it could be a million things that could crack your foundation but that's one of them and now all of a sudden as an adult maybe you're having some relationship problems and you're not connecting it back to that but the lord will the lord will help you get to the root of that thing if there's bad fruit there's got to be a bad root. 
And that yoke can be snapped and broken. New Holy Spirit muscles. And that's why I have basic trust next to that, because that's ultimately what we're doing, is that we're, we're substituting that lack of trust for authority with trust for the Father. How many trust the Father? Say it by faith. I talked about generational sin last week. I'm not going to go back over that. But I think this identification of love would be one that's worth talking about for a minute. And I have imprinting counterfeits, and that might sound like two words that don't go together, but anybody know what I mean by imprinting? You know, you might have seen it with uh, the geese. Maybe when we had the class, you saw it how if a little duck gets born and the mother duck's not nearby, they will imprint to whoever is living nearby them. Could be a German shepherd. And the German shepherd will sit there, and the, and the little geese will come all around the German shepherd, and then you see the shepherd walking down the street, and there's this whole long line of geese going behind. And, and it's just a picture of how we act. Because if I'm born into a, an inner city culture where there's a lot of violence and there's no man in the house, who am I going to be attracted to? The men that are out, out on the street. Because I know I need a tribe. I can't do this on my own. I can't, you know, we're not wired as human beings to just figure it out. We imprint to something. And now as an adult, I may have had that imprinting to the wrong thing. Let's say I'm a woman and I was raised in a family with a lot of violence. And, and now all of a sudden, I think love means being violent to somebody. And my friends are all looking at me like, no, that's not what it means. Well, in my, in my culture that I grew up in, the people that said they loved each other were physically violent to each other. So I got a misimprint. I got the wrong imprint, so now as a woman, I might be attracted to a violent man. How's that going to work out? Not too well, is it? Not good, yeah. And, and that, that's about as painful as it gets, right? Not just physically, but uh, literally and figuratively. So how do I fix that? I got to get a new imprint. I got to get the anointing to come in and break the yoke. And I have to recognize I have a wrong picture of what love really means. And it's not violence. It's not disrespect. It's Jesus kind of love. It's what this says love is, not what my culture said it was when I was growing up. Selah. All right. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, you know, I don't want you to worry that I would go through all of them. But these are just pieces of the puzzle if I could say it that way, responsibility overload, we call that parental inversion. Kids that grow up in homes where there might be a, a substance abuse problem, and now all of a sudden the parents, when they should have been cooking dinner, are passed out on the couch because they're drunk. Now what does the kid do? Got three little brothers and sisters. The nine-year-old kid's going to try to figure out how to make dinner. That's too much responsibility. That's a responsibility overload. But you know what? They do it. They push through. And then when they're 10, they do more. And when they're 11, they do more. And by the time they're 15 or 16, they can run a whole household. But what happened to their childhood? <laughs> Never got a chance to play. Never got to tap into that creative side. Coloring books, dance lessons, the stuff that some of us probably take for granted. But now you meet them as an adult, and they're like, man, they know how to get a lot of stuff done, don't they? And guess who else they want to get a lot of stuff done? <laughs> you. <laughs> so no matter how much you do, you can't outwork them because they're working harder than you and they know how to do it faster and they can do it with one hand tied behind their back. Is that healthy? No, not really. Not really. Because if they can't rest, they just have to, you know, what, what, they, what we say in the class is something that Sanford says, they have to resign from being the master of the whole universe <laughs> and recognize that other people can help them too. Now, is it their fault that they grew up in that situation? No. But are they still dealing from the effects of it? Even though they're Christian? They know the Bible? Speak in tongues? Right, but there's still a yoke that only the anointing can break. That's good news. You guys should be smiling now. <laughs> Almost done. How about self-sabotage? I, I skipped over a couple there. <laughs> That's what I said before. It's like... You told your whole life you're never going to amount to anything, and then you're, you're talking to a friend, and they were doing really good, and all of a sudden, they quit their job. How, where did that come from? That's what self-sabotage is, right? We saw it when we worked with people at the uh, Market Street Mission, people that are in recovery. They're doing great. The, the program's nine months long. Eight months, they're doing everything great. They get with a, within a month of leaving, and they 
They pick up again. That's the phrase they use. They pick up again. Because now they're getting too close to the end, and they're going to have to go reconnect in society and, and live up to people's expectations. And that pressure just causes, you know, they say, I'm not going to make it when I get back out there, so I'm going to quit before you fire me. Is that the Lord? No. Is that the devil? You better believe it. Is that a yoke that can be broken by the Lord? Yes. That curse is broken in Jesus' name. The anointing breaks that yoke. Believing who God says you are will eliminate self-sabotage. You'll be able to accept the fact that, yes, I might, I might make a mistake. Look, you know, the mountain of problems these guys have coming out of these places is no small thing. Many don't have a driver's license. Many of them have to pay thousands of dollars in fines to the state just to get their driver's license back, never mind a car. Don't have a car. Need money for that. Don't have a place to live. My, my ex-girlfriend, I better not go back there. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe my wife will take me back. How's she going to look when I walk back in the door? Not necessarily thrilled to see me. It's going to be like, show me. Don't talk about what you're going to do. Do it. Yeah, not so easy, is it? So you could see where these men, I only knew the men, but it's probably the same, would have a really like, oh, am I going to be able to make it? But if they don't have a relationship with the Lord, man, the odds just go way down, don't they? Because now it's just willpower. Nobody's got enough willpower to sustain that. It's got to be Jesus' power, the anointing power, the Holy Ghost power. It's sustainable. It's renewable. It's coming up from the inside of you, and it's like solar, man, and the sun is always on. You're connected to the grid. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. About 58 minutes. I'm timing myself. 1 John 3, 24. For all who obey his commands find their lives joined in union with him. How many obey his commands? Do you find your life in union with him? Say yes. That's a good thing. And he lives and flourishes in them. So there you go. If you're in union with him, he lives in you and he flourishes in you. That's 1 John 3.24 from the Passion. We know and have proof that he constantly lives and flourishes in us by the spirit that he has given us. So can you do me a favor? Just put your hand on your heart right now. Say, Holy Spirit, remind me that you live inside me and that you flourish inside me. And that the Lord is a very present help in a time of trouble. Okay, let's leave it at that. See, it's really good. Flourish is one of those beautiful Bible words. Constantly lives and flourishes in us. And we know that by the spirit that he has given us. So if you're finding yourself down and depressed, tap into the power that's already in you. The Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you should be guilty if you're blue about something. But just don't camp there. Don't live there. Pick up the phone, call somebody, get prayer. Get into a, a, an accountability group and, and be with other Christians that are going to be life-giving people to you. All right, and then only one more to go after this one. I love you all as those who are in the truth. This is 2 John. I love you all as those that are in the truth. And I'm not the only one. For all who come to know the truth, share my love for you because the living truth that has a permanent home in us. Ho! Say it again. Put your hand on your heart. The living truth has a permanent home in me. That's good news. Man, that's good news. And will be with me forever. It says it right there. That's the word of God. He lives in me, and he's going to be with me forever, regardless of what lies the devil tells me. All right. So you know this one from John chapter 4. If you drink from Jacob's well, you'll be thirsty again. Who's he talking to? This is Jesus. Red letters. Come on, Josh. The woman at the well, you drink from this well, you're going to be thirsty again. But if you drink of the water I give you, what? You'll never thirst again, and you'll be forever satisfied. When you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, springing up and flooding you with endless life. 
So I just needed that picture for my own life in that when I feel that yoke has been there way too long and everything I've tried to see it snap, nothing snapping it. I've got a gushing river of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me that's going to like be like a hydro dam that's going to burst up on the inside and break that thing that's holding me back. Amen? That's what he said right there. Spring it up and flooding me with endless life. And then in Peter, it says, I've been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. My new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. You guys have been great today. We're going to end with a declaration, so stand. And I know a lot of you know this verse, but for those of you who haven't memorized it yet, I want to burn it in because it's one of those rich little gems from the book of Isaiah. So many of them. All right, ready? Got your voices warmed up? Isaiah 49, ready? Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, even the captains of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who... Please say that again. For I will contend with him who contend. One more time. I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. So let's say it. Say it out loud. Say it out loud. The Lord will contend with the one who's contending with me, and he will save my children. And if you don't have children, and you just focus on the first part, that the Lord's going to contend with the one who's contending with you. Everybody in here got some yoke somewhere that needs to be broken, right? I don't think that's something to be negative about, because how many have already been broken off your life? How far has he already taken you from where you were? So don't let the devil cause you to focus on what you don't have. Look at what you do have and say, you're going down, devil. <laughs> That, that strap, that yoke you've had on me has been on way too long, and the anointing is going to break the yoke. So, Lord, we're just so grateful that when, when we study your word, we learn the truth, and it burns into our hearts. And I just pray for every yoke that's represented here, for your power to come in and move mightily in our lives and break those yokes off. Let us hear the snaps breaking right now. The chains coming off and falling to the ground. Let us literally hear the, the yokes fall and hit the floor as your power comes in and snaps that thing off of us. We want to grow so big and strong on the inside, Lord, that nothing the enemy throws at us can hold us down. And, Lord, we thank you for the promise in Isaiah 49, 25, that you will contend with the one who's contended with us, and you will save our children in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.